I think, um, I think we can start. Um, first of all, good morning. I'm Julian Tyndall Bisco, and I'd like to welcome you to today's UK Health Charity Webinar. Uh, we have Diabetes UK and Marie Curie Cancer Care, and the webinar is hosted by Instant Atlas. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speakers. Today we have Gavin Terry, Healthcare Policy Manager, Diabetes UK, and joining Gavin, we have Emily Garside, service developer in the analytics team at Marie Curie Cancer Care. Uh, Gavin and Emily will explain how they're using interactive mapping and profiling tools to report incident rates and give commissioners the intelligence they need to make informed decisions. Following their presentations, uh, Dr. Pierre Jenkins, who um, hopefully isn't having um, uh, internet trouble anymore, will, ahead of internet support, will discuss in greater detail the main features and functionality of solutions used by Gavin and Emily's organizations. Um, at the end of all the presentations, there will be a Q&A session where you can ask Gavin, Emily, or members of Instant Atlas team uh, any questions you want. Uh, we expect this webinar to last around an hour, and it will be recorded so you can listen and watch again or pass to your colleagues. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping points. If you have any questions, then you can use the WebEx Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll field the questions to the appropriate speaker. And, and please note that all questions will be answered at the end of the presentations. Should we run out of time, your questions will be answered by email. If you have any problems viewing the presentation, you can contact support at geowise.co.uk, quoting conference event number 958-613-943. That's 958-613-943, and we'll try to help you out. In line with uh, the GOI's privacy policy, we do not publish the identities of all webinar attendees. Okay, uh, that just leaves me to pass you over to Emily and Gavin. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. So, Emily, it's over to you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Emily, and I work in the analytics team at Marie Curie. Um, so, we started developing the Atlas um, last year in 2012, um, and it was launched in October. So just to give you a brief overview about Marie Curie, so we're an end-of-life care charity, and we're dedicated to the care of people with terminal cancer and other illnesses. Um, we were founded in 1948 in the same year as the NHS, and on the slide you'll be able to see our mission statement um, and our core values. So um, how do we put these values into practice? So we have some core services, um, the Marie Curie Nursing Service, uh, which is a network of 2,000 Marie Curie nurses who work in the homes of terminally ill patients across the UK. Uh, we have nine hospices spread across the UK. Um, we, we also have extensive experience in service design, um, and we can help commissioners design fully integrated um, end-of-life care services. We're a leader in research um, and innovation around palliative care. We also fund some research into this. And finally, the charity advocates um, on behalf of patients with terminal illnesses. So why did Marie Curie um, need the Atlas? Well, that's the main reason on the slide. We wanted to um, give commissioners of end-of-life care insight into care provision in their local areas. Um, allowing them easy access to their data, which would uh, help them to make decisions to improve services and outcomes for end-of-life care patients. So we faced quite a big challenge um, when we were starting to pull together the material for the, for the Atlas. Um, no previous UK tool existed, um, whilst there were some excellent in-country tools such as the end-of-life care intelligence networks, uh, Atlas, which is for England, and there wasn't anything which covered the UK. Um, and this is because it is really difficult to uh, get all the data um, and have it in sort of a standardized form uh, at the level of individual health geographies. So this slide shows 
you guys all the different types of organizations who we worked with in order to gather the data for the atlas um, from out, the Alzheimer's Society to the Office for National Statistics um, in Northern Ireland. Uh, we had to use the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency, um, and the list goes on and on. So that's a screenshot of the atlas. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you a very quick uh, run through of the atlas itself. Um, and then you'll be able to see kind of how it works and the, the way we, we wanted to design it. So I'll just switch um, to the Atlas D. Okay, so um, here you can see the Atlas. Uh, when we started thinking about creating one of these tools, one of the important things for us um, was the design of the tool. Um, we wanted to minimize clutter on the screen to ensure that there was um, a good data to ink ratio. So we wanted to have quite a lot of white space and, and make sure it was very user friendly. Um, this was important as well so that we could have a very large map in the center of the screen um, to enable users to, to really see the important part of the atlas. Um, we wanted to save some space by having information in pop-ups. So, for example, um, if users want to know more about the indicators on the side, um, so say they wanted to know a bit more about population size, they could click here and lots of detailed information would come up. So rather than having this information automatically appear on screen, we wanted to save some space there. Um, we uh, we're also pleased with the fact that the Atlas has a function where you can zoom into a specific area of the country. So, for example, uh, by clicking on this box here, say you were from Scotland and you wanted to know a bit more about um, some data in Scotland, you could zoom in uh, by simply clicking on that. Um, we also felt it was important, especially with all the health reforms, um, to be able to show the new CCG map. Um, so I'll just clear the section. So we couldn't, we don't have any data, unfortunately, as of yet for the CCGs, but we were able to have an overlay of the CCG boundaries um, so that users could kind of roughly see where their areas uh, overlapped with the new CCGs. Um, we wanted to make sure that users could give us feedback about the Atlas. So we have a feedback button here which takes them to an online survey. Um, and I'll go through some of the feedback we've received uh, later on in my presentation. Uh, we also have a bespoke help file which is situated here. And users can also download data into a spreadsheet um, so that if they want to make charts or uh, specific tables, then they can do that themselves. So the data we have available is down the side of the atlas. Um, we have quite a range of data from uh, the population profile, so kind of basic things like the gender of the population, how many people are in a certain age category, ethnicity, religion, um, deprivation, percentiles. Uh, we also have something slightly more relevant to Marie Curie, which is the identification and palliative care need. So the number of people with a palliative care need in an area, or estimated number, um, the percentage of people whose palliative care needs have been identified. And um, another one is the estimated percentage of population with dementia, uh, which we obviously got from the Alzheimer's Society. <clears throat> For us, it was really important to have some of the patient and family experience data on the Atlas. So we used uh, data from the Voices survey, um, looking at the quality of care, percentage of people who rated it outstanding, uh, how many people rated coordinated care as definitely being good in that area, uh, relief of pain, and how that was rated in the last three months of life and how well carers felt supported. So I think these four indicators have been found particularly useful uh, by people using the Atlas because 
they're, they're something which hasn't really been um, in a map format before. Um, we also have some data on spend, um, some data on terminal admissions and how uh, that are eight days or over. And um, we also obviously have data about uh, place of death and where people um, have died, whether it's at home or in hospital or a hospice, etc. So that's a very quick overview of the atlas. Um, I'll return to the presentation now. So why is the Atlas useful for Marie Curie? Well, there are several reasons. Um, with 28 indicators, the Atlas obviously supports the implementation of uh, regional, national, end-of-life care strategies because it provides insight into populations and their end-of-life care needs. Um, it also supports NICE guidance on commissioning end-of-life care for adults. Uh, and this NICE guidance recommends carrying out a local needs assessment, assessment to estimate service need and plan plan capacity. So that's quite important for commissioners to be able to do that and for staff at Marie Curie when designing services. Um, the Atlas also helps to identify gaps in service provision. Um, for example, it can show where one area stands relative to another in terms of, for example, the identification of dying patients. Um, we were also attracted to the product because um, of its ability to present data in a very visually meaningful and uncomplicated way. It's intuitive to use and it helps to reveal trends and geographical variation much quicker than um, a spreadsheet could do. And I think also as well, um, for the analytics team itself, it's been really great because people can self-service their data needs so they can log on and find a piece of data quickly rather than having to come with ad hoc requests to us. So some feedback about the Atlas, which we got from our user survey. So just under 80% of people said they found the Atlas quite easy to use, um, which I think is, is really positive. We also found that just over 45% of people found the Atlas quite useful for the work, and 35% of people found it very useful for their work. So again, um, very positive ratings. I pulled up a little bit of feedback as well um, from the survey. So you can see that it has been really useful to people outside of Marie Curie. Um, so someone meeting with an MP, for example, and someone else has, has kind of reflected on the accessibility of the data. So in terms of future developments, um, we're looking to develop a HTML5 area profile in the future. We want to keep doing general data refreshes um, of the Atlas. Obviously, we don't have any CCG data uh, at the moment, um, so it would be really great to have that in the future and just to upload new data as of uh, and when it comes in. And we'd quite like as well to develop some funnel plots um, to put on the Atlas to kind of help uh, check for bias and help ensure that we have accurate interpretations of the data. So if you have any questions, then I'm happy to answer them at the end. And the web address to the Atlas is also there. So you guys can go ahead and have a play around with the tool yourself. Great. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Emily, for your presentation. I think we can all see how it has um, been very helpful for you. And also interesting to note that commissioners are now starting to play this back to you. Um, so they're obviously finding it useful. Um, OK, now we are moving on to our next presentation, which is with um, Gavin Terry of Diabetes UK. Um, Gavin, I will um, pass over to you now. I think actually, Gavin, can you? We need to unmute yours. You need to unmute yourself. I can't do that at the moment. Okay. Here. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, lovely. Oh, again. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Gavin Terry. I'm policy manager at Diabetes UK, um, and I'm leading our Diabetes Watch project. Um, so just a bit about our organisation there. So we're the, the UK's leading charity that cares for people with diabetes. 
Um, we've got 165,000 patient members and 35,000 professional members. Um, and as the uh, headline says there, there are now just over 3.8 million people in the UK who have diabetes, including nearly a million who have type 2 diabetes but don't know it. So we've got a lot of people to serve. So just some of the things that we do as a charity. Um, so we provide care and support to things like our uh, care recommendations, our publications and our care line. We spend around six to seven million pounds a year on research looking for different uh, things to do with cures for diabetes but also for ongoing prevention and management. We run large scale uh, campaigns. At the moment we've got several campaigns that are running for a four to five year period. Um, we promote um, prevention of type 2, so looking at all of the issues around obesity and the rising tide of uh, type 2 diabetes in the country. We do community work through our regions and managers and our voluntary groups who also are based in the communities and the regions all across the UK. We have our professional membership where we offer services to um, diabetes healthcare professionals including training, conferences and um, advice and involvement. Um, as I said, we have our supporters, which is our lay supporters, which is people with diabetes and their families. Um, and as I said before, we represent it in all four nations. So we have Diabetes UK offices in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. Um, so just to say a bit about Diabetes Watch. So Diabetes Watch is a project that was launched a couple of years ago. And essentially it's the way that we monitor what's going in. Uh, going on in the National Health Service around diabetes across the UK. Um, and one of the things that it does is links to one of our key campaigns, which is our 15 Healthcare Essentials campaign. Um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of data published, including the um, NHS Right Care Diabetes Atlas of Variability and its um, specific Diabetes Atlas of Variability and various audit reports that show how variable standards of care are across the UK for people with diabetes. Um, so what we did was we looked at what the key things were. There's the nine care processes that people should get every year, which is uh, derived from NICE guidance and the NICE quality standards. Um, and then there are also a few other things that we thought people should get routinely, including things like access to psychological care, good inpatient care, um, and access to structured education. And these make up the 15 Healthcare Essentials campaign. Um, so we essentially developed the Diabetes Watch online tool using the Instant Atlas Server Profile tool to enable people to get feedback on that information and for us to be able to present it to them in a way so that they could see what their local services were like. And as I said, what we have within the diabetes community is loads and loads of data. We've got a very large um, national audit program lots of different data sources looking at lots of different things and so the difference between data and information is we have lots of data but not very much patient facing information so um, our role as part of the sort of diabetes information community is to take the very complex data that comes out of all the various audits um, and other exercises and then actually make it palatable and easy for people to understand so they can actually see what's going on. We used the Instant Atlas um, tool to map a selection of data to some patient areas um, so that they can check against the 15 healthcare essentials um, what they are getting against what they should be getting um, and it shows the data for their local areas against national average figures. Um, and there's just a, the, the 15 healthcare essentials from the audit reports and um, one of the PDF downloads that they can take from the Instant Atlas tool. Um, so this is just a picture of the desktop, um, and the reason that we used the server profile tool for this was because it suited this task, um, because it's linking to directly to the other campaign. Um, we had to put it in context, so it's got the text there and the links that explains what the 15 healthcare essentials are, um, and also how people can link into it and what they can do. Um, and there's just some screenshots there, but I'm going to go now into... Um, share my desktop to show you the tool. Let me just find it here. So here we are at the home page for the tool um, and as I said there's the contextual text there and what we've got here is a drop down for people to select where they live. Um, so we've got at the moment it's still primary care trust in England, NHS boards in Scotland and local health boards in Wales. Unfortunately there isn't a data set for Northern Ireland that we can use um, that's robust enough. So that's one of the areas that we're working on is getting better data for Northern Ireland. But if we're just going to the primary care trust for England 
um, then people can select their area. And now these are all set out as the PCT titles, but if people don't actually know what their local PCT area is, there's um, on the launch page from the website, there are a couple of a couple of links to different NHS websites where people can identify what their local PCT or health board are. So if we just pick one as an example, let's have a look at Bexley. Um, so then what we've got is it brings up the title of the trust and using the information that we've submitted into the profile, it automatically fills in here and gives the demographics data for Bexley or the, the area that Bexley Care Trust covers. So it shows you then that is the population covered, estimated number of people who have diabetes, and then the prevalence compared to the prevalence figure for England. So that's the first thing that comes up. Um, it links to the 15 healthcare essentials so that people can go back to that at any time. Um, and then what it does is it goes through the different elements of the 15 healthcare essentials and gives the um, data for each of those. Um, now what people can do here is if they want to, if they don't want to keep clicking between windows, they can click on the metadata here and it will bring up an explanation of what that measure is in more detail. So they can always reference that to see what that uh, that measure is. Um, and as they go down, one of the things that we asked um, GOIs if we could do was to threshold the data in each of these. So what these are... Um, shows the figure for this for the HbA1c here against the national average figure so the national average is always in sort of grayed out um, but then here these are rag rated so red amber green rated but within that particular measure against other PCTs so it shows that they are uh, lower than the national average but they're also in the bottom 25% against all of the other PCTs that are in the data set and then that carries on down for each of the indicators. So we've got you can instantly see where people are doing really well, doing not so well, or need to do a lot more work. So the first part of those is the care processes, and that refers to the, the nine care processes that people should have every year. Um, and then the other data we have in there is some outcome figures, which is treatment targets from national audit data for that area. Uh, come back to that in a minute. And then the other bit, which the other bits that we added in was services in place. Now these come from a data set which is not recordable audit data, but from a program called Diabetes E where PCTs self-assess to say that they have policies in place. So where this says people should receive personalised care planning to meet individual needs, what that actually means is that Bexley Care Trust have said yes, they have a policy in place that um, says that personalised care planning should be used for people with diabetes. Um, and then where we've got no data available because some of these areas are lacking in data, we've put that there. Um, and then down at the bottom we have links there. We've got a link there to a feedback system so people can um, go and tell us if they've got any specific issues where we refer them either to our care line or to somebody else that can help. We have a link here to um, where they can join Diabetes UK in any capacity they want to via Diabetes Voices or the voluntary team or if they want to um, contact us for any other reason. Um, and then here is a repeat of the ones, the links that were on the launch page which tells them how to get to their local service um, NHS pages where they can then look for further details about services in their area. The other thing that people can do, um, as I said earlier, is to export this to a PDF or provide a link to this profile. Exporting to the PDF has been, I'll just see if that happens, um, been very useful. We've predominantly targeted the use of the tool to our diabetes voices, um, who are uh, sort of highly trained volunteers who work in our regional areas um, and actually go in and engage with the local commissioners and service providers. So in order for them to go in with lots of detail, it's been really handy for them to um, print one of these PDFs off and take it in along with the 15 healthcare essentials um, background data. So as you can see it there, it comes out exactly as it is on the screen, very easy for them to take along um, and we've had some really good feedback about that. So if I just go back to my presentation. Um, so 
what the tool does essentially is it gives, as I said, it gives people with diabetes and their families something that they can compare their local care with. Um, and we've also been able to use it in other lobbying as well to um, produce sort of constituency specific uh, reports, which we've then given to MPs and engaged with them in lobbying exercises um, for them to raise issues. Um, so it's been really powerful um, in terms of how people have taken it out and actually used it. Um, let me just go back to. And some of the feedback that we've got is um, directly from people in the Diabetes Voices where they've actually taken it in there. So they, said they found it extremely easy to use, informative and useful. Um, and they're exactly, that was you know, precisely the second bit there, is exactly the feedback we wanted that it's made it really easy for people to quote the figures and take it into somewhere um, and actually get some um, dialogue going with their local commissioners about the services that need to be in place and where the areas of variability are. So in terms of what we want to do, um, I said the profile tool is really useful and we will be developing that to um, include CCG level data um, and also updating all of the national audit data that comes in as and when so that it's constantly up to date. But alongside that we also want to provide an Atlas tool um, similar to what Mary Curie have done um, with um, indicators down the side so that people can look at specific indicators from uh, other data sources. Um, so we'll essentially have a, a Diabetes UK Atlas and the profile tool for Diabetes Watch separately. Um, and also one of the things that we'd like to do um, is to see how many of those data sets that we can actually get live links to so that the data um, automatically updates and, and then we just oversee what's happening. Um, and that sort of concludes my presentation. And obviously, if you have any questions that you want to ask us about the tool or how we've used it, uh, the profile tool, then please ask. Um, and just there is the link for the diabetes.